I'm on the screen. All right. For all those out there in the web land, um, this is Tucson, Arizona, the Controlled Environment Agriculture Center at the University of Arizona. And today is another opportunity to have our Covering Environment Seminar Series. And in a moment, I'd like Rafi to come up and introduce our two speakers. Uh, for those out there, we will have uh, both speakers uh, complete their presentation before we go to questions. So we will get questions by the internet. Um, Dave will uh, pass them along, so we'll ask them as well. Um, and for all those in the audience, again, cell phones, please down. Thank you for coming. Rafi Gruner, who is organizing much of this, please stand and uh, show the world who you are, and thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So today is uh, kind of an unusual seminar for this unit because SIAC is supposed to grow food, and what we are going to learn today is that maybe we're growing too much. Uh, so it's a kind of a, uh, uh, cognitive dissonance. But you will find out that this seminar is very much a topic that is of importance, uh, not only for growers, but for the entire community that consumes food. Because while I would say here in Tucson we have probably enough food on the average per uh, person, uh, there are lots and lots of people who go hungry. And so I would like to just quote one a statistic which I found absolutely amazing. 40% of all food that is bought in grocery stores, in supermarkets, ends up in the dump. And uh, I didn't want to steal this thunder from the speakers, but I'm hoping that the speakers actually will provide a thunderous presentation so that all of us can start thinking about how to conserve food and how to may I say, redistribute food so that all of us, the entire global community, can have enough food to eat. So I think this is going to be a very interesting seminar. And our first speaker is uh, Dr. Pat Sparks. Uh, she's from the Department of Nutritional Sciences. And uh, she has been involved in uh, examining um, what people do with food how to take some food that is not used and distributed, and uh, also talking about attitudes toward food and food consumption and food waste. Um, then our second speaker is also from the U of A, uh, Tori Ligon. Uh, she ha has a master's degree. She has been working in this field for about five, eight years, and she is now uh, working on her PhD so very active in this area, and we'll find out exactly what she has to say uh, about all of this. So I'm going to turn it over to Pat first, and then uh, Tori is going to do the second half. Welcome, and thank you very much for coming to give us this presentation. Well, thank you for having me. <clears throat> Good afternoon. And I'm talking today about food waste. I'm gonna, we're gonna go through some global statistics, um, globally, there are, the estimates are 805 million people are chronically undernourished. Some estimates put that at a billion. And the edible portion of food that's wasted, there's a little bit more that's wasted than the 1.3 million, I mean the 1.3 billion tons. And there are estimates that say that that 1.3 billion tons of food could feed all those undernourished people four times over. Um, it's estimated that this food waste generates 3.3 billion tons of the carbo, uh, carbon dioxide equivalent of greenhouse gases, and that the total volume of water used annually to produce the food that's wasted is equivalent to three times the volume of Lake Geneva, or another, another uh, body of water is the entire water that's in the Volga River in uh, Russia. 28% um, of the world's agricultural land is used to produce this food, and 24 million acres of, uh, of the forest is deforested annually, and 74% of that is deforested to produce food. 
Um, the other thing that's really sort of disturbing is that very little of this food is composted. And it causes landfills to be one of the largest producers of greenhouse gases. And I'll get into that a little bit later, but home composting could divert up to 150 kilograms of food waste per household per year. And what this would amount to in the United States, because there are 134 million households, is more than 220 thousand tons of food waste that could be diverted from the landfills. Now this, this particular slide shows you where, where waste occurs. Um, we have the developing countries, they have a lot more waste in agricultural production, and the developed countries have more food waste at the retail and consumer end. But the other thing you see here is you have certain areas where there's more waste in agricultural production than other areas. So it's, it's not universal that it's all being wasted at the consumer end. And one thing that, that I have seen, and I'm gonna, gonna the, the direct economic impact of the food waste is about $750 billion annually. Now this is global food waste. And I have a feeling if they took, if they put the uh, fish and seafood in there, because some of the sources that I have studied said that about seven out of 10 fish are not used because they're either the wrong species or they are not the right size. So if they were added, this, this amount probably would be close to a trillion dollars. Um, now I'm gonna talk about the food waste, uh, food waste in the United States. And there are estimates, it goes anywhere from 30%, which is the USDA figure, to 50%, which is what um, Say No to Food estimates food waste is in the United States. But the figure that's most usually bandied about is 40% of the food that's produced here is never consumed and it ends up being wasted. And this uses about 25% of all the fresh water that we produce to produce the food and 4% of the um, total US oil consumption goes into producing the food that's not consumed. Now this particular graphic shows you exactly where consumers are wasting food. You can see, you can see up here dairy products, the 17% is never consumed. You get down here to meat and you have 33% and so forth around the, around the uh, graphic here. But it just tells you there's a lot of food that's wasted. Now this next graphic looks at all the food that's wasted and it gives you a percentage for all food items that are wasted. And you can see, if you look at this, you, you can see that more than probably about 80% of it are foods that are perishable. So we buy too much and then we, you know, it doesn't get, it doesn't get used or too much is produced and it doesn't get sold. These are things that can happen and lead to this waste. This particular slide just goes through the whole thing, the whole thing and looks at looks at how much money is, is um, involved in food waste. This is at the retail level, so this would be grocery stores and probably restaurants, and here's the consumer level. You see we have $118 billion that's wasted at the consumer level, and that's just in the United States. So this represents a, a significant loss of resources. Um, Food waste is the second largest category in the landfills. It's um, producing a lot of methane gas because it's anaerobically broken down once it gets to the landfill. And it also costs us in the US over a billion dollars annually just to get all this food waste into the landfills. Um, if you were to purchase uh, the if, if the food were purchased at retail, this amounts to 100, almost $166 billion that is being um, wasted, basically. And what this translates into is about 273 pounds per person per year and almost $400 per person per year. Now, if you think about a family of four, that's about $1,600. And wouldn't you rather do something fun with that $1,600 rather than throw it into the landfill? 
Um, the USDA and the EPA, based on all of this research, in September of this year, um, set the first U.S. food waste goal. And along with um, retail food, food retailers, the agricultural industry, and some charitable organi organizations, um, set a goal to reduce food waste by 50% in the next 15 years, so by 2030. And this brings me to some of the things that are going on that could help be potential solutions. Um, one of them is packaging. And I'm going to talk a little bit about nanotechnology and a little bit more about edible antimicrobial films. And the second topic, there's some research going on at the, at the University of Arizona with regard to the antimicrobial films. Um, nanotechnology has a lot of applications, and there's some very interesting um, aspects of it. Um, certainly, we have barrier packaging, and I have another slide that talks about that in a little more detail. Um, there's active packaging that can change a little bit. It has the capacity to change to protect the uh, food that's in it. There is something called intelligent or smart packaging. And this packaging, apparently, if you get a hole in the package, it will it will um, close up the hole. And then, of course, there are biodegradable packages and edible packages. And these will certainly help with um, landfill problems. And they also help, help with uh, food waste problems because they, they function to increase the shelf life of a lot of products. First, first on this list is, is oxygen scavenging. And oxidation is responsible for a lot of uh, food waste. Next, we have water vapor removal. Sometimes these packages will have little sachets in them that are hygroscopic, so the water is attracted to them. So it takes water out of the, um, out of the package. Some also have uh, the capability to remove ethylene. And ethylene is the gas that's responsible for the ripening of fruits and vegetables. And then there are some that actually release ethanol into the package, and ethanol is a, is a product that decreases mold. So this is used a lot in bakery products, but it can also be used with uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. Finally, there are temperature regulators um, that can regulate the temperature over the uh, outside of the package, and you have antimicrobial nanocomposites. The antimicrobials will be um, injected into the, into the nanocomposites. This particular slide looks at um, ways that oxygen scavenging can be de decreased. I mean, certainly, whoops, we went to, certainly we have um, these compounds, the ferrous iron and the um, titanium dioxide, those are oxygen attractors, or those are things that will pull oxygen out of the environment. But then you have these, these uh, nanoclay iron-based uh, uh, particles that are embedded in plastics. And what you see here is if they're not in there, oxygen or water can go either way. Because sometimes you want water in the package and you don't want it to come out, or a little bit of moisture and it can escape. But if you have the nanoparticles in here, you can see whatever's going through has to take a much more circuitous route. And that route helps preserve the product and it increases the shelf life so the, the uh, theory is that that should decrease, um, decrease waste. Now, some research that's going on on the U of A campus is antimicrobial edible films. And these have a lot of different uses. They are made of fruits and vegetables. So they're, they're an organic product. It's not anything that's, I don't mean organic like organic, USDA organic, but they're made from organic materials. And they could be USDA organic too. But they have a lot, of, uh, a lot of positives. They can prevent moisture loss. They can prevent cross-contamination. They might reduce the microbial load in the food. Well, they certainly do reduce the microbial load. Um, they can reduce oxidation and um, browning. They can prevent the loss of volatile flavors. And they can also serve to pick up off flavors that might be in the package. Now, what we see here are these are some of the microbial films here. This, this one is made with apple. The one in the middle is made with hibiscus. And then the one on the end here is made with carrot. And they will inject into the films an, an antimicrobial 
a product. And these two products are natural products that have been used in these films. The Carvacrol is from oregano. You can get it from oregano oil. And the cinnamon aldehyde, as you would suspect, is from cinnamon. And what you see in this bag is a piece of uh, the edible antimicrobial film. This is, this is from the carrot. Now, when they put them in the bags, they don't put them in in large pieces like that. They break them up so that they can get, so that they can get dispersed throughout the bag, throughout the bag of leafy greens. Um, and then they, they work to reduce the microbe load. And here you see um, the results from the study. And they've done these with a lot of different microbes. This one just happens to be the Salmonella Newport. And what you see here is with the 3% Carvacrol that they have a huge reduction in the microbe load. It's, it's, from the beginning, it's, it's, it's um, you know, five logs lower than the, than the control. And, and you see that even at 1.5%, you still, as time goes on, you get a great reduction in the uh, microbes. The same thing happens for cinnamon, but it's not as dramatic as with the uh, Carvacrol. And then you see the same thing, the same trends you see with the carrot film. And then I have another, another where they did hibiscus film. And, and this one, actually, the hibiscus, it's made from the flower part of the, of the plants, made from the flower. And you can see here, this actually has, whoops, wrong way. This actually has a little better, better decrease in, in um, the microbes because you see even with the 3% cinnamon, you get it down to very small numbers after seven days. So these are very, um, th these, these hold a lot of very promising potential to increase shelf life of of uh, products. Now, these are these were results with leafy greens, but this has also been used with meats. And the interesting thing about meats is when you do an edible film on a meat, you can actually take it off the meat. And when and when the um, edible film was used with the meat, there was no residue from the flavor on the meat once it was cooked. So we're, there were no sensory issues. And they're still doing testing on on sensory evaluation for for some of these films when they're used in the um, edible, in the, edi in the greens packages, in the bag salads. So this is Dr. Ravishankar's um, research, and um, there's her, her uh, contact information. So if you'd like more information about this, you can certainly feel free to contact her. You can contact me, and I can put her in touch with you. Now, from here, I'm going to go on to some things that are actually on the boots uh, happening in southern Arizona. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but 35% of the produce in the wintertime comes through the Nogales Port of Entry. And that's a lot of produce. And most of it is warehoused along I-19. I don't know if you've ever noticed it when you drive down to Nogales or if you've ever driven down to Nogales. But there are a lot of warehouses along the, along the road as you go down, and then there are warehouses behind those warehouses. So there is a lot of produce in that part of, in, in that part of southern Arizona. And if it doesn't get sold or it doesn't get purchased, it goes into the landfills. And this is a very conservative estimate, 750 semi-trucks going into the landfill on an annual basis. And each one of those semis can have 24 uh, pallets of produce on it. So that is a lot of waste. So there's a group out of uh, Phoenix. It's called the 3000 Club. And this particular organization, I've been working with them for probably about five, five and a half years. Um, they're really into reduce, reuse, um, and um, rescue things that would otherwise be wasted, and food is one of them. So what they started about six years ago is a program called Market on the Move. And they bring the produce to Phoenix and Tucson, and now they go to Casa Grande, Green Valley. I think there's, there are also some produce being distributed in Sierra Vista and Benson. But people can come and, and um, get 60 pounds of produce for $10. And you say, well, isn't that going to exacerbate the problem? Because who could use 60 pounds of produce? But the uh, philosophy behind this program is to 
those who can do the 60 pounds of produce to get it and then distribute it to other people. Um, for this program, there are a lot of churches that will come and get maybe 180 pounds of produce, and they'll use it in their, in their um, food banks, or they have feeding facilities where they will use this produce to feed those who, who don't have the means to, to get the fresh produce. And it's a great way to distribute produce to those who, who might not otherwise get it and um, take care of another problem at the same time. Um, in the last year, there's another group. It's, it's, and actually, this is sort of an outs, outspring of uh, Market on the Move. It's called Produce on Wheels Without Waste, and it's the same principle. So every Saturday from November until June, there are sites in Tucson where you can go and find this produce um, available. OK, so these programs rescue more than 32 million pounds um, annually, but there's still a lot more that could be rescued. There's, I think, 10, 10 million pounds is a, probably a very conservative estimate of what else could be uh, rescued. So um, the 3000 Club has livestock feeding programs where they work with the livestock producers, and um, they will come and get some of this produce that's slated for the landfills, and they, could, um, and they can use it to feed to their livestock, whether it's pigs, cows, horses, whatever they might have, they can use it. Um, they're also, they also have some composting programs that are in place to take care of some of the, the uh, produce. And then whenever, whenever these events occur, if there is waste, sometimes there's a, a sub, you know, sometimes there's a modest amount of waste, sometimes there's practically none. But if anybody does co composting, they're welcome to come to the events and get the, uh, the produce that wasn't distributed and uh, composted. Now, the latest is um, a, uh, a program to turn this uh, produce that's not used into fertilizer. And this is a joint effort between Renature. Renature Inc. is the company that has the technology to do this. And they're working with Veggies Inc. And Veggies Inc. is one of those large produce um, warehousing companies that are along I-10 and the 3000 Club. And they've just started doing this. And it, the technology uses aerobic bio bioreactor technology. And that aerobic uh, digestion of the um, products is far faster than either composting or the anaerobic uh, production or the anaerobic digestion that takes place in the landfills. Um, this process, it doesn't emit any methane. It doesn't use very much energy, and it also uses very little water. I mean, these vegetables, vegetables are primarily water. You're looking at 80, 85 probably plus or minus percent water in most vegetables. So this is a, this is a really great program that's just started. Um, the plan is in Rio Rico, and they just started doing this third quarter of this year. And right now, they can process at least 2,000 uh, pounds a day. But their goal is to um, get up to um, 10 tons per day or 20,000 pounds daily, and eventually, um, they want to eliminate produce from the landfill. And that's a pretty lofty goal, and it would be a huge, a huge boost for southern Arizona. And the, the um, fertilizer that they're producing currently is a liquid fertilizer. Um, they may get to the point where they can convert it into a dry fertilizer, but right now it is a liquid, a liquid fertilizer. OK, thank you very much. And now I'm going to turn this over to Tori. Okay, can you all hear me okay? Okay, thank you. So I'm going to talk about um, 
a really specific area of food waste, which is how we all as consumers can possibly be throwing away so much food from our own kitchens. I think Pat did an uh, outstanding job of, of setting up this problem for you all and possibly enlightening you uh, about just how big this problem really is. And now I'm going to try to talk a little bit about some empirical research that I've worked on that's trying to address some of the why question for why we're all discarding edible food from our own kitchens. And I'm going to start by just telling you very briefly about why I got interested in this topic. It all started from hearing that statistic um, that Rafi mentioned at the very beginning, that 40% of the food that we're growing in this country is being thrown away. And I was pretty astounded to hear that number, as I'm sure most of you uh, were the first time you heard it. And I started to think about the fact that I really hate wasting food. I think it's a really terrible thing to do. And everybody I talked to said the same thing. Everyone I know hates wasting food and thinks it's a terrible thing to do. And so we've got all of these people not wanting to waste food, and yet somehow 40% of our food is being thrown away. Then on top of that, you have this, this fact that this is not something that we do occasionally in our lives. We eat food every single day. We consume food at the grocery store uh, every single week, at least. So theoretically, it's the kind of thing we could get better at. We could become more efficient over our lives at knowing what to buy so that we don't throw away so much food. But it turns out we don't. So uh, that, that sort of set up my question. We hate doing this. We're not getting any better at it. Why? Uh, why is this happening? So I began to dig into literature on you know, demographic variables that are linked to food waste. I found out that families with children throw away more food. That's not surprising. Uh, I found out that people that work full time throw away more food. That's also not really surprising. They have less time, perhaps, to you know, manage their inventory. But it didn't really get at the, the psychological factors that might be contributing to this food waste. So um, I decided to do my master's thesis on this question, which is uh, when making decisions about food acquisition, preparation, consumption, and discard, what factors are leading uh, to food waste at the individual or household level? I didn't mention at the beginning, but I'm from the um, family and I'm from the Department of Family and Consumer Sciences, so I'm interested in the consumer decision-making process, the family unit as a, a point of uh, research. And so I'm going to talk very brief briefly about my methodology for the study that I undertook, and then I'll spend most of my time talking about the findings. So in order to dig into this question, I decided to use a qualitative method, uh, and I specifically use something called grounded theory. And qualitative methods can be very good for digging into complex topics for which people don't necessarily know what's going on. And so I did a lot of in-depth interviews with consumers. Um, I started, uh, this was specifically in the Tucson region, so I'll start off by saying that these were Tucson consumers. And I had a starting pool of 120 uh, interested individuals in this study, and I, and I um, collected a pretty in-depth screening questionnaire from all of them, uh, specifically looking at a couple of variables, uh, their employment status, the family's income, the composition of the family, so whether it was a single person, a couple, a family with children, and then the planning tendencies of the main food acquirer in the household. Uh, so from those items, I was able to select a group of consumers to be part of the study. In the end, I interviewed 17 people. I had an in-depth interview in the beginning where I spent an hour talking to them uh, all about their food processes, uh, their beliefs about food, their values about food. I should say that I, they didn't specifically know that I was doing a study on food waste, so I made it sort of a general inquiry into all of their food beliefs and practices. I then sent them home to do a two-week-long uh, diary study where they tracked everything that they consumed and threw away, and I had them simultaneously save all of their grocery receipts during the study period. And then finally, I brought them all back in, and in the final interview, I looked at specific consumption decisions from their diaries and their receipts. So I would ask them questions like, 
On Tuesday night, I see that you ate stir fry with broccoli and cabbage. Why did you decide to make that? When did you buy those ingredients? What was the process for uh, serving that food? Who was at the table? These kind of specific um, memory triggers so that we can really talk about their, their psychological process in that, um, that consumption moment. And I also use their receipts to identify things they might be overlooking in their diary because we know that people underreport on any discard diaries that they're asked to keep. And so I could ask them something like, you know, you bought cabbage on this grocery receipt, but you didn't eat cabbage during this diary period. Can we talk about where that cabbage is? What may have happened to it? Is it still in the refrigerator? So it was just basically a way to trigger their memories and talk about a more specific event rather than the general idea of wasting food. And I'll, I'll tell you in a few minutes about why it turned out that that distinction was important. So now let me jump into my, um, actually before I jump to my study findings, I'm going to tell you about a framework that I use to kind of interpret and make sense of this data. So uh, Bawa and Ghosh developed this framework. It's a framework for understanding the total cost of shopping. There are a few elements basically that go into it. The cost of goods, the cost of travel and time spent to acquire goods, the cost of holding inventory. You put all these things together and you get the total cost of shopping or uh, holding food in your household. Okay, so discussion of findings. The very first important finding I found, which probably won't surprise you, is that people totally neglect the cost of the food that they're throwing away. This happens for a few reasons. First of all, it turns out that tracking grocery receipts in general is very complex. You have to be tracking not only what you're spending, but possibly what another person in your household is spending and aggregating that data. You have to be separating out often grocery purchases from other purchases that may be on the same receipt. Like at Target, somebody talked to me about how they also buy socks and soap when they go to Target. So actually knowing that their grocery portion of the bill was $37.25 is an effort, and an effort that they're probably not going to make. So the bottom line is that even though people care a lot in, in, in the idea of how much money they're spending on their food, they actually almost never have any idea how much, food, how much money they really spend on their food or how much their food is worth. So then when you start to think about tracking how much those discards are worth, you realize that that's an almost impossible task because it first requires that you know what the food in the first place cost you, and then it requires that you quantify how much of that got thrown away. So people don't have any idea what the, the value of the food they're throwing away might be. In addition, they underestimate the volume of waste. So this was a really interesting um, sort of anecdotal finding that came out of this. I went into this study feeling like I care more than average about wasting food, and I'm more conscientious than average. It turns out every single person in my study felt the same way. They all told me they care a lot about food waste, and they don't waste food. Their neighbors do, their family members do, their friends do, but they don't. Uh, which really uh, made me laugh because it's basically the same way I felt going into this. Um, so if you're not acknowledging that you're wasting food in the first place, um, if you, the, one of the, well, let me step back and say, uh, one of the several reasons I found for why people aren't acknowledging it, in addition to this general belief they had about themselves that they're not food wasters, uh, one is that it's easy to omit whole categories. For instance, the food that your children may be throwing away from their lunches. People almost never acknowledge that on their food diaries, but when I would ask them, well, I know you have children, so what happens? Do they, do they eat their lunch at school? I know my kids don't eat their lunch at school, so... They would say things like, oh, 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 yeah, oh, yeah, you know what? I totally forgot everything that came home from my kid's lunch. I totally forgot everything I drank. A lot of people didn't include any beverages in their entire food diaries. Um, they also had this really interesting ability to justify any specific discard. Well, of course I had to throw that hummus away because we ran out of carrots to eat with it. Of course I had to throw away that, um, you know, the leftovers from the restaurant because we actually ended up going out to dinner the next night. There was always a very particular reason uh, why people would throw it away. 
And this was really interesting because in the first interviews, everybody told me that they absolutely hate wasting food. They don't do it. It's really uncomfortable. It's just not something that, that they ever uh, want to do. But in the second interviews, when I was pointing out specific incidences of waste, they all said, oh, yeah, you know what? That wasn't a big deal. So in the general aggregate sense, when it's not your fault, it's a really horrible problem. In the very specific sense, when it is clearly your, your fault, then there's some reason why it's just not actually a big deal. And then the final thing is this, they engaged in these really interesting discard delaying rituals, which another scholar in the UK has also found in some ethnographic research he did. And I'm going to show you some quotes in a second. But um, this idea of basically putting things back into the refrigerator that you don't want, knowing that you don't want them, but then you can wait until they mold. Because once it's molded, you have to throw it away, right? Then you're like being wise and prudent, you know, protecting your family from food safety issues. But if it's just something you don't want, that's too uncomfortable to acknowledge. So you put it back, and then two weeks from now, you can throw it away. OK, so here are some quotes from this, um, from this portion of the, the study. So Kyle says, um, I feel like I'm wasting, I feel like I'm throwing away money. You know, good money was spent to purchase that food. And if you don't consume it, then you wasted money. And that's a precious resource in my house right now. Turns out the reason people hate wasting food is they hate wasting money. Everybody said that the money was the biggest reason they hate wasting food. Uh, so this is um, from the, the specific incidents of wasting food from interview two. Wasting food happens from time to time, and I don't get too bent out of shape about it. Uh, now, this one was a really funny one. So this woman, in the, again, in the second interview, in, re, in response to a specific incidence of waste, she said, I knew when I put it in my little container that I did not want to eat that. And so I put it in the container, and I brought it to work, and I went ahead and ate nothing rather than eat that because I just didn't want to eat it, and I threw, away, threw it away. So I don't know. I, I've actually had this happen to me, too. You go through the ritual, again, of pretending like you're going to eat it, because once the can is open and you've taken it to work, you've got to throw it away. But you can't just throw away a can. That feels too uncomfortable. And then this is actually my favorite one. I usually will stick unwanted food back in the refrigerator in the hopes that someone else will eat it. And I guess by someone else, I mean my husband. <clears throat> and she could acknowledge that she knew her husband wouldn't eat it. But there's always this hope, right, if you put it back in the refrigerator. OK, so then moving to my second finding, this was another interesting one, but probably not surprising to you. The cost of shopping for food was highly salient to people. It turns out we feel, most of us, like grocery shopping is a chore. Uh, part of the reason for that is that grocery shopping turns out to be a very complex pattern in our modern retail environment. Because you have to decide, first of all, whether or not you're going to go shopping right now. If not right now, when are you going to go shopping? And then most importantly, where are you going to go shopping? We don't all go to the neighborhood supermarket anymore. So almost half of Americans are now shopping at between four and seven stores per uh, seven stores on a continuous rotation throughout the year. They're using a lot of different. Um, variables in, to influence where they're going to shop. It could be the price, the location of the store, the product selection of the store, and even sales. So a lot of the consumers in my study were shifting their patronage based on the weekly sales at various local grocery stores. And um, this is important because people don't buy, even when people shop at four or seven stores, they don't buy everything at all four or seven of those stores. They buy particular things at each of those stores. So you may buy canned goods at Target and chicken at Costco and bread at Trader Joe's. You're not probably going to buy bread then at Costco because you get bread at Trader Joe's. And so once people have their specific stores where they want to get their specific things, you can see how you get into this complex scheduling dilemma, basically, around when you're going to go get something. Because if you run out of bread, you have to think about what else it is you might get at that particular store 
and how you can efficiently plan for your next trip to that store and what you're going to get there. And this doesn't even address the decision of what you're going to buy at that store, which is an even more complex task. So people engage in all kinds of list making. Some people do menu planning. And then there's the, a very elaborate inventory checking rituals that some people go through, not everybody. Some people don't check inventory at all. Uh, all of these things add, add up to um, a task, a complex task. So here's a few quotes about this. I have a thing on my fridge, and every time something I need comes to mind, I'll put the store name and what I need because I know where I've got to get it. Again, you get particular things at Target, particular things at Costco. Costco is a staple, but then for special items, we will go to Fry's, Safeway, and Walmart. In any given month, we'll hit all those stores multiple times. That's from Kyle. And Rick said, both my neighborhood grocery stores have good produce selections, and they have good prices, but they don't carry the bread I eat. I go to Trader Joe's for that. Uh, and I know in my family this, this is true for us. We have our list of things that we get at Costco and other things at Trader Joe's, other things at the co-op. It makes the task of acquiring groceries that much more complex than if you were to just get everything at the neighborhood grocery store so that whenever you run out of anything, you can just go to one place. Uh, this is sort of on the, the chore of, of planning for and choosing food. Grocery shopping to me is a chore. I don't really enjoy it. I just want to get in, get out, and have everything I need. And to me, there's this, somewhere there's this magic formula that will give me that, but I haven't found it yet. And I encountered a number of people who had this notion that if they just tried this other app, or this other way of making lists, or this other way of managing inventory, it would all come together. But they just hadn't quite figured out what that perfect combination was. And then Rose actually had a very long quote, but this is just one tiny part of it. There's too many choices. Sometimes the grocery store is overwhelming. And probably some folks in this audience may have experienced a similar feeling in some of these gigantic grocery stores that we now have. So, while the cost of grocery shopping was highly salient to people, again, now we get back to something that, that's not highly salient, and that is the costs associated with overbuying and storing inventory. So um, if you think about how much effort is involved in going to all these different stores, you know that overbuying can actually make strategic sense if you're optimizing on choice. It can actually save you money and time and certainly frustration if you can not have to go back to a store that's not part of the rotation right now. For instance, I know if we have already gone to Costco, I do not want to go back any time until the next time, three or four weeks from now, when we are supposed to go back to Costco. Um, but people aren't acknowledging all of the costs associated with with overbuying, and those can include, first of all, the electricity used to run all the extra refrigerators that Americans now have. Over 20% of Americans have a second refrigerator or freezer in their house. Uh, in addition, sometimes that can even be associated with keeping a larger kitchen than you might otherwise need if you weren't holding so much inventory. And one thing that people drastically underestimate is how much cognitive attention they are putting toward managing all of this inventory in their generally well-stocked kitchens. So there's a lot of mental energy uh, going toward managing inventory. And then, of course, there's, there's you know, tying up capital in inventory that might otherwise go toward something else. So this is just one quote about this. Uh, this guy, Kyle, said he's got an extra freezer in his kitchen. And a couple of weeks ago, Safeway had ground beef for $2 a pound the cheapest I'd seen ground beef in a long time, and we bought like 30 pounds of it. So we often see this kind of mentality. This is a little bit extreme, but it's on sale, stock up. <clears throat> so you put all these things together, and, and what does this mean? We've got people who are completely neglecting the costs of the food they're throwing out, focusing a lot of attention on how much effort they're putting towards shopping, and completely overlooking any effort or costs associated with buying all this inventory. What that means is that for a lot of Americans, we've shifted to this um, situation where we are all keeping a generally well-stocked pantry. 
we're not buying for particular meals often. We're just buying to, to have enough in our kitchens so that we can essentially shop our pantry at dinner time and make something. Um, food waste is an inevitable cost of overbuying, if you think about it, because at some point, if you've overbought, you've got to get rid of that excess. Food is a particularly problematic uh, item because it's perishable. So you overbuy to take advantage of sales. You overbuy to make sure you don't forget something. You overbuy to make sure you've got everything you need to make whatever you might want to make in case a guest stops by, in case you get a whim to bake a cake, whatever it may be. But food is perishable, even canned goods. People don't think that canned goods get thrown away, but they actually do. But canned goods are definitely a component of the waste that we're all throwing away. <clears throat> so one of the things that it seems like consumers are doing is they're basically using an incomplete value model. So they're overweighing the saliency of the shopping costs, and they're undervaluing the associated costs of that of overbuying and throwing away. And in this way, food waste is, is basically an adaptive behavior that's come about from the, the complex modern grocery environment that we live in, where we have tremendous choice and selection, where it is a big effort to go out and get the foods that we want, um, and where we want to minimize the effort spent shopping. But <clears throat> this brings me to my implications which are basically counter to this modern trend of, of stocking up and, and shopping infrequently. If you think about it, a lot of the, the um, advice that you see on these like how to reduce food waste um, you know, tip sheets, they deal with things once you've gotten the food home to your kitchen, how to manage your you know, freeze portions, um, how to rotate your inventory, how to, how to designate what food is leftovers and put it at the front of the shelf so that you see it. Now, these are all good things, but if at the end of the day the problem is that you just have too much food, then they're really not going to deal with the problem because they're not dealing with why you bought it in the first place. And so um, part of that is that this advice, it, it kind of ignores the fact that as human beings, we have really um, a very limited ability to accurately predict what we're going to eat in the future. So if I'm trying to say what I'm going to eat next Thursday, I really don't know how I'm going to feel. I don't know what else is going to happen in my life. Um, human beings really have the ability to predict accurately what they're going to eat for the next day, maybe, because that's the time frame that you really have a sense of what you're going to be doing. So here's the advice. The advice is shop more often buy less each time. Now, some people say, well, that's, that's more expensive because part of why we're buying so much food is because we're taking advantage of all these sales and we're buying things when, when, uh, you know, when they're in season and it's a good prices, whatever. But if you think about the statistic Pat shared that $390 of food is being thrown out per person in the United States, we have a lot of room to spend more on a per item basis and still come out ahead financially. Uh, one of the things that people do legitimately bring up is that shopping every day or every other day just doesn't really work in our modern lifestyles. And there is some truth to that. So here are some of the, the, the other maybe frontiers in terms of changing our shopping pattern so that we can shop more in line with our actual ability to predict, predict what we're going to eat. First is grocery delivery. Uh, this is a big up and coming um, trend in the retail market. We can see this with Amazon Fresh. You can order food by 10 a.m. and have it delivered by dinner time. And um, that, that is potentially going to allow people to order in the short term without losing the choice selection that they've come to, to really rely on. And the next is big data analysis. There's a lot of new apps now that have come out that really seek to help you manage your inventory. There's a new one called Cookbright that I was um, testing this summer that basically lets you take a picture of your receipts to keep an, an online digital inventory of your 
kitchen, your pantry, and then pull, receipt, pull recipes from within the app to deduct those um, quantities from your inventory, and then actually even so suggest recipes to you based on this idea that you bought chicken a week ago, it's going to go bad, why don't you make it, and on top of that, add that cilantro that you bought four days ago, and the spinach that's been there, you know, since two days ago, so you kind of put it all together, and they're going to maybe help you with this cognitive burden that we all have of actually managing the, the food in our pantries. So those are just a couple of maybe technological fixes that may be coming. And um, that's basically what I've got. So now I think we'll open, open it up for questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll have um, questions for both Tori and Pat, so please ask uh, them specifically. You want to come up, Pat, as well? Okay, here's a hungry man. <laughs> I did have a question about the 20% you mentioned that had second refrigerators and stuff. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular, can you expand on that? Is there a particular subset demographic? Are they preppers? Or are they just mm -hmm. normal people? That's a great question. I don't have the answer for that. Uh, it was actually a really hard statistic to even find, and there is a, a nutrition scientist at uh, UNC that uh, basically uh, quantified that number but didn't go into any detail. I wish I could tell you. That's an interesting, it's an interesting thought, though. I suspect that your cohort group that you are examining were all English-speaking and we're not on food stamps. And uh, one of the concerns in terms of nutrition is that there are uh, areas of the country where underprivileged uh, individuals have access to fast food and they have uh, really relatively high profit poor nutrition availability, which usually means very little fresh produce. And uh, I'm glad you brought into the formula time spent and the carbon footprint associated with driving to and from the source of food. And I think in terms of a multifactorial analytical model, as you apply what you've started to learn here to the state as a whole, you might apply some of these variables into how you understand the problem and potential solutions. It may be that shopping more often is buying or, or it's, it's causing more time to be spent and more uh, fuel to be spent in, as a trade-off for some of the nutritional values. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I, I guess I will say a couple things. First, this was an urban population uh, that I was studying. I did have some lower income people in my sample, but it's qualitative. I can't generalize about people in general. I think your point overall, though, is, is excellent that depending on where you're shopping, your options are, are com maybe completely different. And also, it definitely requires a greater time investment and possibly fuel. Absolutely. Other questions? Rafi. So recently in the news, uh, there were a couple of uh, things that caught my attention that have to do with food wastage. And I was wondering if either one of you know about studies to correct these kinds of behavior. The first one is a study from Harvard that showed that it was a very clever study. What they did is they took pictures of the trays of kids going through uh, school lunch, uh, and they took a picture right after they went through the cashier, and then five minutes later, when they were near the trash can, and what they threw away. And it turned out that they threw away all the veggies and all the fruit. So that's one kind of behavior I was wondering about, if you know something that's going on now, to change the behavior of these kids. The second one is something that came up very recently, a couple of weeks ago, there was a big storm in Israel, and uh, electricity was uh, off for about two or three days. And even my relatives there started throwing food away. 
And I called them up and I said, don't do that because food and refrigerator will stay okay, will stay fresh, edible for two or three or four or five days. But this kind of behavior, this fanaticism and uh, paranoia about food going bad and throwing it away. So these are my two uh, examples. Well, that's going to take a PhD dissertation to solve, but can, can you help with that? What, what can you say to Rafi to solve this problem? Well, there are some programs in schools that are trying to introduce fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, there's, there's a USDA program called the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program. And this particular program, but you know, here again, this particular program is, is directed towards children from lower socioeconomic um, areas. So schools that have kids, you know, in more affluent areas aren't even eligible for these programs. And there are also programs in schools where they'll do, where they'll take the, where they will grow the food and then they take it from the garden to the to the cafeteria. And when they do that, you get a bigger buy-in with those kids in terms of eating eating the vegetables that they're producing. Um, it's it's a big problem, and it and it you know kind of goes to um, there are a lot of food deserts out there, which is where where you were sort of getting to. And it just seems like these food deserts are in these lower socioeconomic areas, and so these people get accustomed to fast food or food from a convenience store. And you know, every once in a while we all go into a convenience store and what kind of fresh fruit or vegetables or fresh produce is, is in those kinds of uh, facilities. It's extraordinarily limited and then sometimes you look at it and you go, well I'm not going to eat this because it looks like it's you know a week old. Um, as for as for uh, food sitting in a refrigerator, it there are other factors that are gonna gonna um, have an effect there too. I mean, we're in this country. We're very um, oh, we're very conservative on on keeping food that's been mishandled a little bit. And you know, you get all the temperatures, and they say if it's between 40 degrees Fahrenheit and 135 degrees Fahrenheit, you need to for more than four hours. You just need to dispose of it. And so a lot of people just go by those those recommendations, and those are recommendations from the Food and Drug Administration in their in their food uh, food code. So that can be problematic. If they if they had the um, capability to cook that food, then that's one thing. But you know the other thing is how often do you open the refrigerator door? That's going to have a big effect. I mean you can keep food in a refrigerator if you've got something like dry ice for a longer period of time, but I'm guessing if the um, electricity is out because of a storm, that's not going to be an option for people either. I'll just add one thing. There was actually a woman uh, from University of Oregon who did a, a couple of studies in the late 80s looking at how people are impacted by food safety uh, recommendations and the marketing of this, you know, this idea that you need to be very careful. And what she really looked at is essentially the influence of people's lack of knowledge about food handling and more recent generations have very limited knowledge about how to deal with food once it's not in optimal conditions and so people were very affected this was even in the late 80s by those recommendations because they just had no concept what you might do to make food safe Yes, um, home economics used to be quite a popular class in, in high school. <laughs> and I was trying to recall if we were given any direction as to how to plan our meals and buy our meals. And I don't think we were. I think we really came from a very ignorant population of you do it the way your mother did. And you know, you buy your groceries, throw it in the fridge. If it grows mold, throw it out, do it, whatever. But as a senior citizen, I find that it's all a 180 now. You know, we do a lot of reading the packages, good frozen food, nothing that won't fit in our freezer. <laughs> you know, you shop maybe uh, 
three or four times a week, minimally, and you buy less, <laughs> and, and you test the things out. You know what you're going to eat, and you're not real reckless and trying weird and, and other things. And I have to say, I think when I throw out my garbage, um, collected once a week, and I shouldn't be putting it in those little bags you get your groceries in, but that's my garbage bag. And I may have two of those filled halfway, if that, a week. So I don't know. You know, young people won't probably do that. But as an example of, of something different to do or something to try that might be a little different, uh, might be worth a, an experiment. Yeah, and it actually sounds like you're kind of following this advice then of shopping very frequently, getting the things you know you're going to eat, and hopefully not. Right. Well, that's an interesting thing. Nobody, everybody I talked with, some of them had settled on things that worked for them, but nobody had really learned these habits or, or correct, correct processes for how you manage your inventory. It does seem like something, and everybody talked about, like I said, wanting that magic pill for how this all works. But they don't really know what that would be. I had an interesting conversation with some people from um, England not so very long ago about a similar topic. And they lived in a city in England where they did um, curbside composting. And they said that they they had very, and I think if, if people did this, they would have more they would have less waste because they'd really be cognizant of what it was they were wasting. The unfortunate part with this program was that the city that they were living in stopped it because it was too expensive to do it. There is, if we could change a little bit, there was a question online about uh, the commercial uh, preparation of foods and what to do with that um, not being allowed uh, to reuse it or save it or distribute it. Is there, are there laws? Is there, what about the safety? Can you speak to that? Just well, a little Arizona bit? is one of the states that has a good Samaritan law. So if, if a facility overproduces food, they can give it to a homeless shelter or some other feeding site where it could be used. We, we had a conversation about this a little earlier um, about grocery stores. Why don't you well, I was, I was, earlier we were talking about why grocery stores don't send all their food to um, food banks. And, and I said that actually a lot of them do send a lot of food to food banks. What grocery stores don't want to do is give away food to people that might be consumers. So they're usually pretty strict about not sharing with employees and not sharing with people on the premises, so they lock their dumpsters, which has become a problem because you see all this food rotting in dumpsters and they won't let people take it, but they want you to come in and buy it. So it's sort of, you can sort of see their position on it, but at the same time it's a shame to see it go, go to waste in the dumpster. And it, and it sometimes can be tricky to organize getting all that food to the food bank because you need a certain volume before it makes sense for the food bank to come pick it up. Yeah, definitely some logistical challenges. Do you have a question? A little on a different topic, but listening to both of you talk, it sounds like these producers in Mexico are bringing truckloads of food that they can't actually sell, and consumers are buying a lot of food that they can't actually use, and likely Part of that is because the cost of their time is much more than the cost of the food. And is there a question of, of the basic food being underpriced somehow? I, I mean, I, I think that the probably, real value of the food. That probably is ultimately the problem. We do know that Americans today spend less of their income on food than any other people ever have in history. It's less than 10% of our income on average. So while we have this problem where lots of people don't have enough food, clearly a lot of us uh, are capable of buying way more than we actually can consume. Uh, Professor, I was wondering if you might expand a little bit more on the films um, that you were talking about, uh, maybe some uh, plant-based. Are they plant-based starches for plastics? Or um, who's making these films? Anybody doing it commercially? I don't know that anybody's doing it commercially yet. Um, 
certainly Do Dr. Ravashankar would have more information than I do, but they are doing testing at the university, and the films are, are being made from plants, that, you know, apple, carrot, spinach, they can make them from all different kinds of, of fruits and vegetables, and um, then those films are injected with antimicrobials, and they have multiple uses. And um, presumably, they will eventually find a, um, find a commercial market, because that can certainly enhance the uh, keeping, you know, the, the shelf life of food, so it doesn't spoil as, as quickly. Now, I know in, in the research, they have looked at Pseudomonas. And Pseudomonas is not a, not a bacteria that's going to lead to a lot of uh, food foodborne illnesses, but it is one that leads to food spoilage. And they've had a slightly different, because they'll, they'll be a little bit left, but that particular, that particular bacteria will increase as time goes on when it's not completely killed. So that's, that's a little bit of a problem, but, but I don't know if anybody's doing those commercially yet, but I think they have huge commercial potential. A follow-up question, if I could. Uh, this plast edible plastic or films? Yeah. I can't call it plastic. Is edible, no, they're not plastic. Edible films, do they have any nutritional value and do they have any caloric value? Um, they might have minimal nutritional value and caloric value. But, uh, but on the other hand, that they could be primarily cellulose too. So it's, so it's a fiber that they're going to have, but that's nutritional value. Yeah. Okay. A couple real quick from online, even though we didn't get a lot of questions, we've had a lot of people uh, send in to say thank you for the presentations. They thought it was really great information. And then a question from me is actually two real quick questions. When you studied, did you see a general generational difference in food waste? And then number two, just where you shop. And my <laughs> question would be like Costco. When you buy those giant bags of lettuce, do you waste more than if you just shop at uh, your regular grocery store? Sure. So I can't. So I can't speak on the generational difference from my study because even though I did sample people between 29 and 70, I'm, I don't have enough people to to say. However, other research that's been done in the UK has shown that there really is no difference by age, with one exception. People that were alive during World War II uh, are uh, slightly less wasteful than any of the generations that followed them. So uh, likely that, you know, and this is in the UK, so when they lived through food, food scarcity and food rationing, they learned maybe perhaps some different habits. Uh, in terms of the, the stores you shop at, I don't have any data to support one store versus another, but I do think clearly there is some, uh, it, it would make sense at the very least that uh, not only is Costco leading to more waste, I did have a lot of people in my study who said things like, well, I buy five heads of lettuce at Costco knowing that we only eat three of them, but they've calculated the value of those five heads as less than the cost of three heads at their grocery store. And so it's a, it's a worthwhile purchase in their minds. About three or four years ago, there was a study done between the city of Tucson, Davis Monthan Air Force Base, and Tucson Electric Power. And they were looking at the biomass issue in terms of alternative fuel production and the aspect of having the separation of the organic food waste materials, et cetera go into a unit that would then be a producer of, of power. And the thing that led to the demise of that turned out to be rats. And the concern that it would be a vermin collecting site as much as anything else. I think the most recent figures from New York is there are two rats per human uh, based on the garbage uh, availability. Uh, th this gets into many interesting further ramifications we have the javelinas who periodically, if they discover that the smell is right from the organic materials in the uh, garbage uh, collection unit, they'll go right down the street and clean out five or six of the garbage units. So, Yeah, those are good points for sure. <laughs> Very interdisciplinary uh, area here. 
I have a question. What can you revisit uh, films? And what is the objective? What are there several, uh, three, four different objectives in creating these films or are ed edible films? Um, I think the primary reason is food safety. Food safety. Yeah, because um, the the uh, professor that's doing that, she's in the microbiology department. She's in the um, School of Animal and Comparative um, um, Medical Sciences, and and she is the she's a working in microbiology and fa food safety is a big part of her uh, her research program. So, but there are other other uses as well because they can be. They, they can extend shelf life. They can also, you know, they could add a flavor. They can also, um, you know, take out flavors that are, not, um, that are not desirable. And they can also decrease oxidation. So there are lots of different uses. It just depends on exactly how they're formulated and what is incorporated with that film. Other questions? Questionable comment here. Is that what it's going to be? That's a fine. Comment? A, a questionable I'm comment. I'm definitely not, a, not uh, an expert. The one thing that, that may be helpful for others to recognize as well, as far as the products of the future that will help to address things of this nature, is that with some of the nanofilms, they will recognize the degree of spoilage taking part, uh, place on uh, meat, for instance. And by having that as an indicator, built into the nano or the, the film, they can actually then see that they get things rotated properly out and, and reduce the waste at that level of production and sales. I think we would agree to that, right? Yeah. Why not? Yeah, that's yeah. John. We'll we'll agree. Any other questions? <laughs> we're uh, we're we're getting near to the end here, but um, I found it interesting in your discussions and presentations of the vocabulary. I don't know about the rest of you, but I never thought of having inventory in my closets. It's just boxes of food or whatever. Uh, and I've heard of animal rescue before, but, but food rescue, no. I'd never heard that, that term put together. But I guess it makes a lot of sense. Right? So we, we work from there. I, Having uh, forestalled for a few moments, I see no other questions really dying, people wanting to have questions answered at this point. It's getting late in the day. It was a beautiful Friday. You really helped end our week off very well. And Rafi, do you have any comments? In the spirit of the seminar, please go in the back of the room and don't waste food. Take and eat. <laughs> After all of this, we waste food. Ah, no, please. Well, thank you very much. And for all those who are interested, in uh, on December the 11th, Dr. Merle Jensen will be making a presentation about the history and the future of controlled environment agriculture. And if you have been the opportunity to have named the term controlled environment agriculture, then you can make that presentation. Also, we have a special event that's happening on December the 4th. It's not part of our covering environments, but it is a special guest from Germany that will be speaking about vertical farming, indoor production agriculture using artificial lights. He's doing studies in Germany about that, and I have him visiting for other reasons, and we roped them in for a presentation. So you'll hear about that. But the next meeting of this group is officially the 11th with Dr. Jensen. But we'd love to have you here on the 4th. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend, a good holiday. Food in the background, tomatoes in the back. Don't waste food on Thanksgiving. You'll feel guilty. Thank you.